calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. In a few days' time, King Charles III will be crowned in a ceremony that punctuates our history. We won't just be focusing on the pomp and circumstance, because the coronation was also about conquest, rebellion and murder. In it, our liberties are consecrated. Next week, a special edition of Farage with Professor David Starkey. The Crown, a thousand-year story on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's nine o'clock and this is Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, why spoiled crybaby Prince Harry's vendetta on the British press is bad for this country. In the big story, as summer beckons, are vegans trying to cancel the great British barbecue? And how many conspiracy theories turned out to be true? I'll be joined by a man that's written all about them in Mark Meets. So, big guests, big stories and big opinions. They want to bring back masks. Plus, a load of beer brands have gone woke. All of that is going to be a busy two hours. First, the headlines with Rory Smith. Thank you, Mark. The latest from the GB Newsroom. It's understood the final evacuation flight carrying British nationals out of Sudan has taken off. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden held a COBRA meeting in Downing Street this afternoon to discuss the security situation in Khartoum. He said rescue operations ended following a significant decline in the number of British nationals coming forward to flee the war-torn country. It's understood around 1,600 British citizens have been evacuated on 13 flights from Sudan, but thousands more may remain. Mr Dowden denied the government would abandon those who have been unable to make it to the airfield on time. Great Ormond Street Hospital has been granted exemptions to allow nurses to continue working during upcoming strike action over the bank holiday. The Children's Hospital expressed concerns about staffing as Royal College of Nursing Workers prepare to walk out from 8pm tomorrow until Monday evening in their ongoing dispute over pay. Well, it comes as health workers belonging to the GMB union accepted a 5% pay offer from the government yesterday. Union officials will now vote to accept the offer at a meeting of the NHS Staff Council next week. Tens of thousands of people have taken to the streets in Israel to protest against the country's judicial overhaul. Drone footage shows protesters waving Israeli flags in a square in Tel Aviv in protest against the plans by the country's government to have control over the appointment of judges. The Israeli president has been urging both sides to reach a compromise in the 17th consecutive week of demonstrations. 
A school is set to take Ofsted to court for not following the correct procedures during a review. The Queen Emma Primary School in Cambridge was downgraded to inadequate, the lowest possible rating. While waiting for the Ofsted report to be published, head teacher Ruth Perry was informed of the result and took her own life. In a speech to the National Association of Head Teachers, her sister, Professor Julia Waters, condemned the watchdog and called for Ofsted inspectors to hand in their badges. When three Ofsted inspectors pronounced on frankly flimsy grounds that Ruth's leadership and therefore her school were inadequate. The injustice of that one word judgment destroyed Ruth's career, her world and her sense of self. I won't give up until Ofsted is radically reformed to place the welfare of teaching staff as well as of children at its heart. Three new photographs of the King and Queen Consort have been released ahead of next week's coronation. The images were taken in the blue drawing room at Buckingham Palace last month. One shows the couple standing together in front of a portrait of King George V at his coronation in 1911. The Queen Consort is wearing the late Queen's pearl drop earrings and a pearl necklace from her private collection. TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn. This is GB News. Now though, it's back to Mark. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, why spoiled crybaby Prince Harry's vendetta on the press is bad for Britain. In the big story, as summer beckons, are vegans trying to cancel the Great British Barbecue? How many conspiracy theories turned out to be true in the end? I'll be joined by a man that's been writing all about them. He's got a new book out. He is my Mark Meets guest. In my take at 10, I'll be calling out The Guardian for their shocking hypocrisy. Bonkers scientists who want to put us back in masks. Good luck with that one. And the campaign for real ale goes woke. It's enough to turn you to drink. Plus, it's the coronation countdown with the queen of US royal showbiz and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Among the topics, Meghan and Harry's relationship is toxic, says half-sister, Thomas Markle's last wish, and Prince George's starring role on May the 6th. Now, don't forget Mark Dolan tonight will be live at the Palace on Friday night for Coronation Eve and on Saturday night right here in the studio with the biggest names in journalism, including Kinsey live in the studio. Also tonight, in a world exclusive, we'll be joined by the Irish restaurant boss who has said only biological women can use his female toilets. He has broken the internet, caused a worldwide storm, and he's with us before 10. Now, Mark Dolan tonight is the home of the papers with tomorrow's front pages live and uninterrupted from 10.30 sharp. And joining us tonight throughout the show, three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, Nigel Nelson, Alice Grant and Colvia Ranger. Plus, your emails, especially the spicy ones, mark at gbnews.uk. Now, this programme has a golden rule, especially on a Saturday night. We don't do boring. Not on my watch. I just won't have it. It is the weekend, and I think the weather's improved slightly, hasn't it? So why don't you get something cold and fizzy in the fridge, or fire up the kettle, get the kids in bed, and let's have a night to remember. We start with this. You've got to hand it to Harry and Meghan. They do love a court case. Beats working for a living, I guess. Prince Harry, a man who loathes and hates the monarchy so much he hangs on to the title Prince, is back doing what he loves best, attacking the British press, with legal action against several of our best-known newspapers. Odd that a man whose untold privilege has been achieved from a fawning press who have written millions of words about the royal family, mostly favourable. Amazing that he should seek, therefore, to bite the hand that feeds him. For Prince Harry to go after the British media is the very definition of ungrateful. Let's remember, publicity is the only commodity Prince Harry, the world's least happy millionaire, actually has. 
He doesn't have a job as such. He doesn't make anything. He trades on the PR noise that being the grandson of the late Queen continues to yield. Forget about press intrusion. This man and his, in my view, narcissistic wife, remember, no one ever asks her how she's feeling, wouldn't last five minutes without the press talking about them and writing about them. For Harry to sue the British media is like Count Dracula suing a blood bank. Now, if Harry has been subjected to distressing and unethical press intrusion, then there is a case to answer, and good luck to him. But in my view, this angry young man now suffers a credibility gap as time after time he seeks to have his publicity cake and eat it. He begs for privacy whilst appearing on podcasts, writing books and fronting TV series, sharing his innermost thoughts and the darkest secrets of his family and loved ones. It's my view that the prince and princess of Woke would love it if the press could only write good things about them, and any criticism would see hacks from Fleet Street sent to the tower for the rest of time. Now, journalists often do cross the line, including the disgraceful phone hacking scandal. But in the end, one of the great things about this country is our free press and bold, fearless journalism that speaks truth to power and that knocks rich and powerful celebrities down a peg or two. If someone lies about you, that's libel and you can rightly prosecute. But for anyone else in the public eye, myself included, you have to accept that you've made a deal with the devil. You've put your head above the parapet, so be prepared for people to take aim. Occasionally, I get dog's abuse, and that's OK. I quite enjoy it, actually. So I'm sorry, Harry, if you don't like the heat, get out of the kitchen. Go and live on a boat or something. Move to the Outer Hebrides, we can but dream. But as long as you're coining it for millions of pounds with book deals and TV shows, as long as you're lecturing us ordinary people about climate change, whilst darting around the world in a private jet. As long as you're banging on about making the world a better and fairer place whilst you rattle around your Californian mansion, which boasts, we're told, 16 bathrooms, you can put a right royal sock in it. How dare you attack our trenchant press? Fleet Street has a world-renowned tradition of the pursuit of truth and justice. And with your endless court cases, you want to muzzle that. We need a free press, whether it's the parliamentary expenses scandal, the Matt Hancock leaked WhatsApp messages, or indeed my fantastic, brilliant colleague Dan Wooten, exposing that Harry and Meghan were planning to leave the country in the first place, coining the term Megxit. In all cases, we need a strong and powerful media. What we can't have is rich, privileged, hypocritical aristocrats deciding what is and isn't written about them. Harry shouldn't be embarrassing his family with this court case, given the fact that the royal family and the monarchy itself are so reliant on favourable column inches from the UK press. Without support from the papers, TV channels and radio stations, it's game over for the whole royal project. And the timing of this legal action couldn't be worse, as it coincides with the King's coronation. But in recent times, Harry hasn't worried too much about others, whether it be his country, the monarchy, or indeed his own family. A bit like Harry himself, I sincerely hope this silly court case gets thrown out. So what is your view? Uh, share your opinions on my big opinion, Mark, at gbnews.uk. Do you think Prince Harry's legal action against the press is justified? Let's get reaction now from my fantastic panel. I'm delighted to welcome political commentator Kulveer Ranger. Uh, we also have a top political editor at the Sunday Mirror and Sunday People, the one and only Nigel Nelson, and broadcaster and writer Alice Grant. Alice, welcome back to the show. Good to see you again. Thank you so much, Mark, for having happy me. Happy Saturday. <laughs> yeah, happy uh, Saturday. I just find the sight of mm. Prince Harry going into the uh, Royal Courts of Justice, uh, pursuing the British press once again to be a shocking sight. 
Yes, Mark, I loved what you said about the media needing to pursue justice and truth. I think that's so important. And the British people really deserve that transparency on our political class and our establishment, no matter who they are. And I think what's really important as well is that you mentioned we've had so much has come to light recently, especially about COVID and the WhatsApp messages of Matt Hancock and all these really important quite like serious scandals which the British public really deserve to know about. So I think it is important that we have a media which which is able to scrutinise our political figures because that's what we deserve, the public. Yes, I mean, Nigel, you are well qualified as a legendary Fleet Street scribbler yourself. <laughs> you don't want to be sent to the Tower for saying that Prince Harry's a ginger... Windsor, but what's your view on this? Well, first of all, can I just, just say I'm no longer political editor of the Sunday Mirror. I'm GB News senior political commentator. You have had an upgrade. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> exactly. I had a promotion. Uh, yeah. We stand correct, and it's fantastic to have you as part of the GB News family, I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, when, when it comes to your, to, uh, your monologue, I agree with every word you say. I, mean, I, I love sort of, sort of uh, you talking about bold and fearless journalism. Yep, that's what we're, that's what we're there for. Uh, telling truth to power, absolutely. That's that's the job of, of journalists and taking celebrities down a peg or two mm. when they deserve it. Myself included, and now that you're a GB News star, yourself as well. <laughs> if you're in the public eye, you do make a bit of a deal with the devil, don't you? Yeah, no, I think that that's a, that's a serious point. Uh, and it's quite right that, it, that if you choose to put your head above the parapet, as you put it, um, yes, the, you're, you're going to actually... You, you run a risk of being uh, getting some negative publicity as well as good publicity. The whole point is, I think, especially with television or cinema or whatever, when you appear on a screen, people are rightly interested in your personal life as much as your professional one. And that applies on the football field, it applies in politics. You can't... You can't completely divorce the two. In other words, you and I, by appearing on the screen, actually sacrifice a certain amount of our privacy. Mm, although, Coolveer, the Prince would argue that he has suffered severe press intrusion, uh, that it's possible the law has even been broken. And, of course, this guy is mentally scarred from the loss of his mother, who, let's be honest, was, was effectively hounded to her tragic death by uh, a, an avaricious and greedy press. You're right, Mark, and which is why we all have a sense of sadness for Harry. We, we understand the loss. We all felt that loss of Princess Diana. I mean, we can't imagine what it would have felt like for him and what he's been through. So we have this sense of wanting to almost be on his side, but he's making it hard for us because, as Nigel has said, now has said, th there is a deal made here if you're uh, a member of the royal family, if you're a celebrity, if you want fame, and if you want to cachet on that fame. Because, let's be honest, you've said it before, he hasn't said, I'm walking away from... Royalty. I mean, from being a royal, he's still keeping the title of prince, and so he is still cashing in on that now on the other side of the pond in in the life that he's building. So he's a. It still feels, unfortunately, he's a confused young man about what he's trying to do. And in the court of public opinion, I think we still feel sorry for Harry. We will always, I feel, probably have a bit of a soft spot for him. But whether people are on his side in terms of what he's doing and taking on the British press now for the sins of maybe the past, I think that's the problem. Yes, and I don't think that the British press always get it right, but I would err on the side of caution in terms of constraining the powers of fantastic journalists like Nigel Nelson, who, let me tell you, let me confirm, is now a big star here on GB News, top political commentator, and the dream team just got bigger. Now, uh, lots to get through coming up in the big story as summer beckons our vegans trying to cancel the great British barbecue. That's next. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.
So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Uh, well, look, how about this from Sue in response to my big opinion. Hi, Mark. It would be nice if all the British media did not report anything about the Sussexes for the whole of this week so we can enjoy the coronation without those two spoiling it for the nation. Sue, thank you for that. Of course, we are now in the coronation countdown. I've got Kinsey Schofield, the queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, with me just before the end of the hour. And of course, we've got lots more to discuss. King Charles, the coronation and all things royal. But let's get to our next story first, if we can. Just as the weather starts to pick up, in parts of the country at least, and as summer beckons, many will be looking forward to a season of outdoor cooking. But vegan activists have been urging the public to take meat off the al fresco menu and replace it with plant-based alternatives. So could you live without your bangers and your steaks, your ribs and your chicken drumsticks this summer? Are you willing to give up the great British barbecue to save the planet? To debate this is a man who has written at length on the subject of so-called meat alternatives. It's the Telegraph journalist Andrew Orlovsky. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Mark. Good evening. Thanks for having me on. Uh, what are the alternatives to meat and are they a credible alternative? Um, well, I think, I think the vegan craze peaked just before COVID, probably about 20 or 18, 2019. There was enormous investment in, in plant-based foods and uh, everyone was very showingly saying that we were going vegan. But since then, the fortunes of the companies involved in that have crashed. Of course, it, they're very processed food and they're very expensive compared to, to the real things. So that's been a bit of a, um, a flat lining. <laughs> since then. Um, the context for this is important, Mark, because we've had two factors we're, we're behind this great hype. Um, one was that low interest rates meant that venture capitalists threw loads of money, uh, the most ridiculous ideas you could think of, Uber, WeWork, and plant-based meats is one of them. The other was that large food companies had um, uh, stock investors rewarded them with kind of brownie points for corporate social responsibility. So they didn't really want to make them, but they had to make them anyway. Um, and that both of those bubbles have now burst, really. Yes, I mean, the problem with these alternative meats, for example, they're full of ultra-processed ingredients, aren't they? They are. They're also very bad for the planet, because if you think about it, almost all our food is plant-based. It's gone through a cow or a sheep uh, along the, or a pig along the way. Um, what they do is... is 
uh, as about a thousand scientists this week said in something called the Dublin Declaration. I really urge anyone uh, who's who's watching to look it up. Science saying that it's uh, meat is good for human health. Uh, and there's a lot of hysteria saying it's not. But it's also good for the environment. As soon as animals leave some land, the land goes to waste. And they are taking something that's not wor worth not very much to us and turning it into something fantastic that we all enjoy. Well, that's right. I mean, cows, for example, livestock in this country, it's, it's predominantly 99% grass-fed, isn't it? They roam on land which is mm. uninhabitable for us humans and they eat grass which is indigestible. So they're doing us a favour. Yeah. They are. I mean, I don't know if any of uh, the viewers have followed the, the lab-grown meat uh, hype, but they, they find they simply can't – they grow meat to cells. It's quite disgusting, uh, a meat slurry. It's so revolting they don't show it to journalists. Uh, and then exercise it in tiny pelotons. Uh, and after all that's done, it's 20 times more expensive than real meat. So if you think about a cow or a sheep, it's an incredible protein conversion machine that, that, taste, that produces something that tastes delicious. Do you think maybe the meat lobby need better PR, better marketing? Because I think a lot of people don't realise that when it comes to animals grazing on the pasture, that, that it's quite carbon neutral because they they wee it and poo it all back into the ground. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a fascinating fact that for plant-based products, it generates, for every pound, it generates three pounds of waste. And the only thing you can do with that is to give it to an animal uh, to, to, to eat. Blimey. Well, we'll be next, won't we? And uh, we've seen local authorities in this country going plant-based, universities, schools. Uh, this is happening <clears> now <throat> at quite a high level, the push for plant-based. Yeah, well, this is the danger. I mean, you, in your last point, you said, do they need better marketing? Well, I gather 91% of us eat raw, you know, take, take some meat, raw meat, and cook a meal with it every week. Um, but where I think the danger is, is in exactly as you say, um, the New York City mayor has just banned meat, <clears throat> excuse me, in hospitals and in schools. And they're two groups that really need a healthy diet. They need the iron, they need the vitamins that, and minerals that come with meat. And children need a healthy diet as well. So uh, this is really where this push is going to come through, bureaucrats in schools and school uh, administrators and, and mm. really all, all the parts of public life they can ruin, they will try and do that. Uh, what would you say to those that argue that dairy farming has a disproportionately large carbon footprint compared to plant-based uh, crops? Um, well, I'd say, so what? It's very, very good for the environment. It's a natural fertiliser. And when China's building a coal-powered station every five days, you really shouldn't worry at all about meat. In fact, you shouldn't worry about aviation either, because um, <laughs> it's simply not going to have any impact at all. If you want to feel better in virtue signal, go ahead, do what you want. But it's actually having no impact on the planet. And it's actually, as the Dublin scientists have said, it's very bad for the planet to go plant-based. Uh, indeed. And, and uh, I, I just wonder whether veganism, do you think it's potentially a passing fad? I mean, I've got lots of viewers and listeners who are vegan and, and many of them say they feel mm. fantastic on it. But do you have a view <laughs> on the vegan diet? Um, I know you've got a couple of daughters. How would you feel if they went vegan? Uh, well, it's, up to, it's, it's their choice, really, to, to, to eat what they want. But I know they, uh, they're very discerning about the food they have and think very carefully uh, about the flavour it has. And, mm. and that's what we should do. We're up against a kind of austerity of the spirit, really, here, where, where everything, everything must be corralled into this one view where there's only one thing to worry about. CO2 and whether whether anything tastes what things taste like doesn't seem to matter it's a very anti-human movement and one way we can rebel against it is simply by enjoying food whether it's vegetables or meat uh, now uh, my team have put out a poll earlier uh, earlier in the day and we've been asking you the great british public would you give up the great British barbecue to save the planet so let's take a look at the uh, results of that poll uh, would you give up the Great British Barbecue to save the planet. Yes, 21.5%. No, 78.5%. So uh, clearly, Andrew, the authorities have got a ways to go convincing the public that they're going to go plant-based. I think so. And it's an uphill struggle. We should we should enjoy the gifts of life that we've been given. And meat is certainly one of them and all power to the meat industry for fighting this really kind of quite wretched and dismal campaign against it. I mean, do, do you think it could get more authoritarian in time, though, Andrew? Because, Andrew, we're going to be talking about COVID later. Mm. 
And you remember early in the pandemic, they said, look, it might be a good idea if you wore a mask. Uh, it might be a good idea to have your meetings online rather than going to the office. What started as a suggestion became an instruction during the pandemic. Could that happen with plant-based, <clears throat> where you eventually get a meat allowance, a couple of steaks a week, and you're done? Yes, it's already being talked about, isn't it, in some quarters? Um, look, I think, uh, I think the pandemic unleashed an authoritarian streak amongst bureaucrats particularly ones who have hardly been elected or haven't been elected at all. And they've really got a taste for it. Now, 10 or 20 years ago, you'd have had somebody at the bottom of their shed with a, with a jar of dead flies next to their desk, writing their plan for how to rule the world. These people, unfortunately, seem to have reached uh, some level of influence in public administration, and that's a real problem. There you go. Andrew, always love reading you in The Telegraph. Andrew Orlovsky, journalist and now broadcaster, of course. Thank you for your thoughts. Um, I do have lots of veggie and vegan viewers, and I swear to God, many swear by that diet. But I think you all agree it's got to be personal choice. Um, this from Cathy. Hi, Mark. I'm vegan, and if slaughterhouses had glass walls, it's not about killing... Sorry, it's about not killing things for me. And that's from Cathy with a couple of kisses. Let me mwah, return those. Cathy, thank you so much for that. Uh, keep those emails coming. Uh, fascinated by our next story. You will not want to miss this. In a world exclusive, we'll be joined by the Irish restaurant boss who has said only biological women can use his female toilets. He has broken the internet. It's a worldwide story. We got the guest. He's next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, <laughs> suffering on a scale right. completely unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said of the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. Right, folks, that Ooh. was a spicy one, wasn't it? With us four, plus a special guest. Sometimes she has to stick her foot in it. Sometimes she has to say things as they are. Sometimes I think we should keep the refugees and send the pensioners to Rwanda. <laughs> then we'd be in a much better state. Well, yeah. 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 The Saturday Five. Saturday nights from 8. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Uh, 
Uh, welcome back to the show. Now, after 10, in my take at 10, I'll be dealing with the campaign for real ale who have had a wake moco... <laughs> I'll put my teeth back in. A woke makeover. I'll be dealing with the campaign for real ale. Also, they want to put us back in masks, folks. You couldn't believe it. Uh, a few more stories as well to get through after 10. But would you give up the Great British Barbecue to Save the Planet. That's tonight's big story. And this from Michael. Simply read the Bible, Mark. God's advice on what to eat, and it is meat. Isabel says, no chance that we'll give up our barbecues. We've already had three this year and are supporting our wonderful farmers. Uh, Richard says, you can't beat a couple of bangers relaxing in the sunshine with a cool beer and the smell of a sizzling meat-filled barbecue. It's part of the great British summer, says Richard. Aaron says, uh, well, look, some people would want to go cannibal to help control the population. Blimey, we'll talk about conspiracy theories later. Plant-based food is made of sugar, which is bad, says Norma. Unhealthy, give me, says Norma, real food. Plant-based food, miles of one plant on the land, no biodiversity. Eating plants gives you wind, says Norma. Norma, I think we may have entered the realms of too much information there, but thanks for sharing it. And uh, how about this on the subject of the royals? That was my big opinion. I'm upset that Prince Harry has decided to sue the British press. I think we need a strong press in this country to hold the rich and powerful to account. And I think that when you're in the public eye, you've got to take the hit. Harry doesn't agree, and neither does Terry, who says, Hi, Mark, a free press is not free to hack phones. Harry did not make a deal with the devil. He was born under the microscope and wants his family to not be killed by media scum chasing people in dark tunnels. He is a prince. He was born a prince. He wants to make a difference and be who he really is without becoming a victim or having his wife and kids become a victim of the whims of ambitious reporters. He stands up for his family and wants to make the world a better place. The British media want to crucify him. The British media could let it go, but they prefer to keep talking about things that anger the public just to get ratings and clicks, and no one is fooled. Terry, thank you for that. This show is all about opinions. It's a very broad church, so keep them coming. Mark at gbnews.uk. Now, let's get to this amazing story. Excited about this. The owner of a very successful restaurant in Ireland, Trayvodes, became a viral sensation after sending this tweet, in which the restaurant owner said, Call me old fashioned, but you're not allowed to use the ladies' toilet in our restaurant if you have a penis. Whilst there has been a predictable backlash from some quarters, is uh, Paul uh, Trayvode has seen his eatery packed out ever since. In a recent interview, he has said, who knew a tweet about a willy could fill your restaurant? Well, I'm delighted to say that Paul Trayvode joins me now. Paul, congratulations. Uh, apparently, you've never been so busy. Well, I tell you, millions spent on marketing over all the years, and you mentioned the word willy or penis in a tweet, and all of a sudden it fills your restaurant. It's incredible. Uh, what motivated you to send the tweet, Paul? Well, there was actually, there was a conference in town uh, in, in one of the hotels, uh, and town is Killarney here in County Kerry, one of the most stunning locations you'll find anywhere in the world. And uh, it was basically saying, it was a trans uh, conference, and they said, listen, we want to remove ladies' toilets and gents' toilets from the signs on the doors, and we want to just call them toilets. And uh, so I'm a firm believer in ladies' toilets is a safe space for uh, ladies, girls, and I turned around and I said, well, that's, you know, you're guaranteed one thing when you come into Trevo's is that uh, if you do have a penis, you're not getting into my ladies' toilets. OK. And what was the initial reaction, Paul? I, I, I'll be honest with you, Mark, I was amazed. I mean, look, I, I have two TV shows on Amazon Prime. I've got quite a prolific uh, social media platform. And I knew that, I mean, look, I was going to draw a bit of attention. But put it this way, if I didn't get the negative comments, I was doing something wrong. Um, so... It started off the usual one or two kind of going, oh, you bigot, you transphobe, all these kind of names. And that's kind of what you get from people who lack the intelligence to be able to have a debate with you. And then all of a sudden, more and more people saw what I was saying. And then all of a sudden they started saying, thank you so much uh, for, you know, for speaking out for us and, and for defending us. Look, like most people, Mark, I've got my wife, I've got my mother, I've got uh, my sister, I've got my nieces, even my mother-in-law. I love them all way too much to be able to make a scenario where potentially a man can put on a dress, 
slap a little bit of lipstick on and say, I'm a woman for the next hour or two and walk into the safe space, which is a toilets, ladies' toilets in, whether it be a restaurant, a bar or a nightclub or something like that. So I said, during COVID, I'm from an industry that was shut down for the best part of two and a half, three years here in Ireland. And I said, the only way you can debate something like this is to force the debate. So if you have to come out with something as rash as a tweet like that, then therefore we force the debate. And here we are, we're talking on a massive TV show here in the UK about, um, you know, men can't be just flippantly walk into a lady's toilet. Uh, absolutely right. And I'm sure you're not transphobic. I'm sure you're a very liberal chap and you, you would take the view if someone wishes to identify by a different gender, good luck to them. But if you have a male physiology, if you're a biological male, you have no place in the ladies' restroom. Uh, and that's that, that's 100 percent right. And, and we've got to force the debate on the fact that there are unfortunately there are people out there who will basically take advantage of a scenario of people are afraid to say something. So you could have the potential of a man that is potentially assault a woman or a young girl inside in the toilets, and we need to address that very carefully. So you can't, and most people are afraid to say because there is a backlash. Of course there's going to be an online backlash. And normally it's from somebody like Johnny4927 on Twitter that has a picture of a goat as his profile picture because he's an absolute coward that will call you every name under the sun. But if I stand up and say it, and then all of a sudden you have me on such a fantastic platform like this, more and more people will become confident enough to turn around and say, actually, you know, this is true. Anybody can just put on a dress, slap on a bit of lipstick, a little bit of mascara and call themselves a woman and put themselves into that position where they could potentially assault or seriously harm a woman. And I'm not going to I'm not going to let that happen, no matter what they call me. Thankfully, it's literally water off a duck's back. Well, let's bring in my uh, other pundits tonight, if we can, into this conversation, Paul. Delighted to have Coolvia Ranger, Nigel Nelson and Alice Grant. And before I come to my panel, um, Paul, what about somebody that identifies by a different gender? Um, it's been something that they've, you know, felt strongly about for many years. They live in that different gender. Um, are you concerned that, that they may be offended by what you tweeted, uh, given that especially within our population, trans people are among the most attacked, criticised, vilified? Well, look, I mean, obviously nobody's going to set out to defend anybody. And that's why I said I do respect anybody who's genuinely uh, transitioning. And of course, and I mean, I put in, it was like in the rest of the movie, they were, because they knew what of the menu. So somebody who's genuinely transitioning, my whole point here is that we have created a scenario where the potential is that any man who wants to endanger a woman's life or anything like that can just basically get himself into a toilet by putting on the dress and calling himself or identifying as a woman for a very short period of time. That's my issue. Not anybody who's genuinely transitioning. It's important that we clarify that because, it, it, I mean, Obviously, we're respecting everybody here, but what we are highlighting is the potential for somebody to be able to come in and do that, and that's what I'm going to stop. Well, indeed. Alice Grant, will you be popping over to Trey Vods when you're in County Kerry next time you're in Ireland? <laughs> yes, I think Paul is doing such a noble thing in standing up against this, this horrible gender ideology which is really affecting women's safe spaces. It's actually really noble and brave of you to stand up for us because, as we can see in this debate, it's really women and girls who are suffering from this. It's not the men who are worried, but it's the women who are being, who are being really um, attacked in our safe spaces are being um, jeopardised. So I'm really grateful and I think that it's really important that people continue to stand up against this because it's really morally wrong to think that you could have a man in a space where potentially young girls are and that that's obviously something horrific and we must stand up against this minority who seems so loud because they're always platformed but in reality are the extremists if they think that this kind of thing is okay. And, uh, Kulvia, this is an issue, isn't it, in the UK and Ireland for certain cultural and religious groups. The idea of a biological male in a female space is very problematic for, for many people. It is. Uh, I think, you know, I really agree with what, what Alice is saying there. And hats off to Paul, because he's taken on the challenge as well. And I, I hope we get over there to test the food, because I, I hope the food's as good as his, uh, his policies. But I think the real issue here is the silent majority of women that are being compromised. And I think, again, it comes down to those who shout loudest get a view across. And now, don't get me wrong, I am very much for supporting people who are transitioning, um, whatever stage they are in their life, what they're going through, providing them with the support. And f we all know that they've, been, uh, they've, they've not had their voice heard for a long time. So it's really good that in the modern day, they are being heard, seen, acknowledged, and given space and time. But 
we must not just disregard a silent majority of women who feel compromised, who can feel afraid, who can feel like they are being absolutely just ignored in terms of their needs and wants, uh, and things that shouldn't be taken away from them are being taken away. And I think, Paul, yeah. um, well done for standing up for women. However, Nigel, some of this can be political, can't it? There will be some on the left very angry about this move and angry about this conversation. Yeah, yes, I'm sure there would be. Um, and what I want to know from Paul, really, is how he can be so certain he's right. Uh, it seems a bit creepy if a restaurateur was actually asking to look at a customer's genitals before they can go off to the loo. And the answer to something like this is that, presumably, if women are uncomfortable with having um, uh, another woman who uh, identifies as a woman in, the, in their loo, men could be equally uncomfortable in the other way round. So the only answer there is whether or not you want to invest in gender-neutral toilets or a separate place where somebody uh, in this position can go. What, what do you think I, about, uh, about that one, Paul? Well, I think, just, just to put it into context, I, I, I'm clearly not going checking anybody or cupping anybody's genitalia to see if... <laughs> Uh, this is to put it into into real context here. Is that yeah? Uh, well, we all we, all men would wish that was the case, Mark. But it's, it's like that. But I mean, to put it into context, this is more like I saw a drunken man walking into a toilet who I thought was potentially going to cause trouble, whether it be in the toilet toilet, whether it be out in the restaurant, whether it be in a bar, if I thought there was a threat, that's my obligation as an owner of a restaurant, of an establishment, is I remove the threat. And I do it straight away. I don't need to ask the man, is he drunk? I can see he's drunk. OK, and with the greatest respect, it's quite 99.9 .9 times out of, out of 100. It's quite blatantly obvious to see if the person is male or female. So I'm not going to check on anybody's genitalia. Don't, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, Paul, uh, you've definitely got genitalia. You've got a pair of balls on you. I think it's important that you've made a stand. Your restaurant has been fully booked ever since. And I would urge any of my viewers or listeners to book a table at Trayvods in County Kerry in Ireland the next time they are in the Emerald Isle. Great to chat. I'll let you get back to those bookings and those hungry customers, Paul. Thank you so much, everybody. And Mark, you've got to get over here and I'll show you just how stunning Killarney and County Kerry is. The most beautiful place on earth. I'm all over that, and I promise I'll be using the gents. Thank you, Paul. Paul Trevo <laughs> there, restaurateur and uh, hospitality consultant. Uh, next up, how many conspiracy theories turn out to be true? I'll be joined by a man that's written all about them. That's Mark Meats, and it's going to be an explosive chat. That's next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7 p.m. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, a massive response to my interview with the Irish restaurateur who has simply advertised on Twitter that only women, biological women, can enter the toilets in his restaurant. The restaurant has been full since. This from Louise. Hi, Mark. We women need more men like your restaurant owner on your show to fight our corner against transgender ideology. Uh, thank you for that, Louise. Keep those emails coming, Mark, at gbnews.uk. It's time for this. Yes, it's time for Mark Meets. And tonight, whether it's the lab leak theory for COVID, vaccine side effects or lockdown being a debatable policy, plenty of conspiracy theories have proved over time to be true or at least more valid than previously characterised, which is why my next guest has devoted the subject to a new book. It's winning rave reviews. It's called The Diary of a Conspiracy Theorist. And it's out now. Its author joins me, Scott Anderson. Hi, Scott. How are you doing, Mark? I'm very well. Good to have you on the programme. I think there might be some parallels between yourself and my previous guest, the restaurant owner, calling out woke nonsense. In this book, you've called out what you perceive to be the mistakes that we've seen in the course of the last three years. Yeah, it's just been... Uh... Well, you could call them mistakes. <laughs> I think uh, they've probably been done on purpose. But, uh, yeah, I think this whole woke thing, um, there's lots of virtue signaling, which is sort of uh, veering off into other areas, like this whole trans issues just now as well, um, you know, other things. But, uh, yeah, it's basically they've used people's good nature to basically carry out this whole lockdown thing and keep the masks going as you say they're looking at bringing back masks and uh yeah they're just playing on people's emotions basically to uh, achieve their goals basically and the thing is scott you're not some kind of privileged member of the media elite uh, this is the first book you've published what is your background uh, i'm just a civil engineer civil site engineer um as i say in the book i was just working away um and then basically things started happening. Obviously, uh, the news came through that there was a virus spreading throughout the world. And uh, yeah, I just took my own view in it, uh, watched it closely, watched the events unfolding and just formed my own opinions from there. Yes, I mean, quite a few engineers have spoken out against the COVID measures. I guess that by definition, as an engineer, you look at the data, you look at numbers. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that uh, the numbers were inflated via the way they counted the deaths, as they counted them within 28 days of a positive test. So that is just going to massively inflate the numbers, not giving a true representation of the actual figures. And uh, yeah, it was just loads of things, loads of inconsistencies, which I touch on in the book a lot. Yeah. There's loads of things in declaring COVID-19 a no longer high consequence disease days just before the lockdown beginning. The list is endless. Indeed. Uh, in the book, you talk about what you consider to have been the mistakes of the pandemic. Do you think lessons will be learned? Do you think the public would go along with future lockdowns? No, I don't think the public would go along with it at all anymore. Uh, there's very few people walking about with masks now, even though there's still variants. Um, 
spreading, apparently, according to the media. Uh, I can't see the public basically taking part in any of it at all. So why did you go about writing a book? Lots of people would share the view that you have. Um, I should add, contradicted by top government scientists who would argue that all of the measures, the mask mandates, the vaccine mandates, the vaccine rollout, lockdowns, saved many thousands of lives. That is their clear, clear view. Um, but, but, but others disagree with that. You're one of them. Why did you put pen to paper? The main reason was I just thought... In years to come, um, how would you actually describe this to someone? You know, the whole prospect and whole idea of lockdowns, hopefully we never experience them again, but uh, how do you explain to someone in the future what they were actually like? And, you know, it's just crazy. It's the eerie feeling of walking around the street where there was nobody about and, mm. you know, actually being sent home from work and told there was this deadly virus spreading all around the world. It's just, it's like something from a movie. So I thought... You know, I'll write a book about it, and it's also somewhere where people who might be seeing that something isn't quite right, and they don't know how to connect the dots. So I thought I'll put some information together, put it in a book, and um, yeah, they can basically make their own mind up from that, and hopefully it would help them, uh, you know, see it, see things a bit clearer. Have you paid a price personally for your views on these COVID measures and 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 the other propositions, the positions that you take in the book? Uh, just basically the usual, you get called a conspiracy theorist or, you know, uh, you, you might have got laughed at originally uh, to begin with, um, but obviously that's changed now, you know. Uh, the first protest I was at, there was only about five people and now there's, well, in the end, you know, there was probably a million people in the street or near, nearly a million people in the street at London's biggest one. So, yeah, I definitely think the tables have turned and people have seen it for what it actually is and... Uh, they see it as an attack on their civil liberties, and obviously they're not going to allow that to happen. So, um, Scott, would you, what would you say to those uh, who lost loved ones during the pandemic, lost them to COVID, who might feel that your book trivialises or underplays the seriousness of the virus? Uh, I don't think I underplay the seriousness of the virus. Um, people die. People die every year. People die of the flu. I'm just raising questions for instance, the flu completely disappeared. Well, COVID apparently raged throughout the world. And it makes me wonder how one virus can be completely eradicated from the measures that one can thrive. It just doesn't really make sense. Um, and obviously, as I mentioned, it was downgraded as it's no longer high con consequence disease on March 19th, very early on in the pandemic. Uh, there's loads of things, as I say, the 28 days being diagnosed within 28 days of a COVID test, you know, you could well, argue that you've been marked down incorrectly as a COVID death when it's been something else. You know, OK, yes, they still died, but you want to know why uh, and you want to get, you know, I mean, it's it's the right thing to do, obviously, to find out why they actually died and not because someone's just put it down yeah. as a death because it's within 28 days of a test. Well, I, I am very excited about reading your book. I think that there was a horrible overreaction to a nasty virus, but that one, a third of people we were told by the government didn't have symptoms at all. I think that the lockdowns were worse than the disease itself, and that's very much a central tenet of your book. It's there to debate. I'd recommend people make their own minds up. It's out now. It is called The Diary of a Conspiracy Theorist. And Scott Anderson, more power to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Uh, brilliant stuff. Well, let me reiterate that both the NHS and the government and top medical scientists are very clear that the measures they rolled out were essential in saving the NHS from being overwhelmed and saving lives. So that's the review of majority science. But this programme's a broad church and we hear all opinions. Uh, next up, it's my take at 10. Campaign for real ale have gone woke, plus they want to put us back in masks. All of that is next. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. 
People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. <laughs> We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. In a few days' time, King Charles III will be crowned in a ceremony that punctuates our history. We won't just be focusing on the pomp and circumstance, because the coronation was also about conquest, rebellion and murder. In it, our liberties are consecrated. Next week, a special edition of Farage with Professor David Starkey. The Crown, a thousand-year story on GB News, Britain's news channel. It is 10 o'clock and this is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take at 10, I'll be calling out The Guardian for their shocking hypocrisy. Bonkers scientists want to put us back in masks. And the campaign for real ale goes woke. It's enough to turn you to drink. Plus, it's the coronation countdown with the queen of US royal showbiz and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Among the topics tonight, Meghan and Harry's relationship is toxic, says her half-sister. Thomas Markle's last wish and Prince George's starring role on May the 6th. And don't forget, Mark Dolan tonight will be live at the Palace on Friday night for Coronation Eve and on Saturday night here in the studio with the biggest names in journalism, including Kinsey, live here at our studios. So we'll bring you Sunday's headlines in the papers, bang on 10.30 as well. Dolan tonight is the home of the papers. Some massive stories coming in, let me tell you to get through, including that take at 10. So big guests, big stories and big opinions. First, the headlines, brand new to Mark Dolan tonight, the brilliant Rory Smith. Thank you very much, Mark. The latest from the GB Newsroom. 
More than 1,888 people on 21 flights have been evacuated from Sudan, the majority of them being British nationals. The government says the final flight is yet to leave the airfield near Khartoum, even though it was scheduled for 6 o'clock this evening. This afternoon, Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden held a COBRA meeting in Downing Street to discuss the security situation in the country. He said rescue operations ended following a significant decline in the number of British nationals coming forward to flee. Mr Dowden denied the government would abandon those who have been unable to make it to the airfield on time. Tens of thousands of people have taken to the streets in Israel to protest against the country's judicial overhaul. Drone footage shows protesters waving Israeli flags in a square in Tel Aviv in protest against the plans by the country's government to have control over the appointment of judges. The Israeli president has been urging both sides to reach a compromise in the 17th consecutive week of demonstrations. Great Ormond Street Hospital has been granted exceptions to allow nurses to continue working during upcoming strike action over the bank holiday. The Children's Hospital expressed concerns about staffing as Royal College of Nursing Workers prepare to walk out from 8pm tomorrow until Monday evening in their ongoing dispute over pay. Well, it comes as health workers belonging to the GMB union accepted a 5% pay offer from the government yesterday. Union officials will now vote to accept the offer at a meeting of the NHS Staff Council next week. A school is set to take Ofsted to court for not following the correct procedures during a review. The Queen Emma Primary School in Cambridge was downgraded to inadequate, the lowest possible rating. While waiting for the Ofsted report to be published, head teacher Ruth Perry was informed of the result and took her own life. In a speech to the National Association of Head Teachers, her sister, Professor Julia Waters, condemned the watchdog and called for Ofsted inspectors to hand in their badges. When three Ofsted inspectors pronounced on frankly flimsy grounds that Ruth's leadership and therefore her school were inadequate. The injustice of that one word judgment destroyed Ruth's career, her world and her sense of self. I won't give up until Ofsted is radically reformed to place the welfare of teaching staff as well as of children at its heart. A ceremony has been held to welcome the arrival of an historic stone as it returns to England ahead of the King's coronation. The Stone of Destiny dates back to the 1300s and is an ancient symbol of Scotland's monarch. It's been shipped from Edinburgh Castle to Westminster Abbey where it will be placed under King Charles' throne ahead of next week's coronation. TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn. This is GB News. Now, though, it's back to Mark. Thanks, Rory. We'll see you in an hour. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. It's the Coronation Countdown with the Queen of US Royal Showbiz and political reporting Kinsey Schofield. Among the topics, Meghan and Harry's relationship is toxic, says half-sister. Thomas Markle's last wish and Prince George's starring role on May the 6th. Plus, breaking why Prince William will never trust Harry again. And don't forget, Mark Dolan tonight will be live at the Palace on Friday night for Coronation Eve and on Saturday here in the studio with the biggest names in journalism. We've got tomorrow's papers at exactly 10.30 sharp with full pundit reaction. Plus a brand new feature on the show, headline heroes and backstage baddies. Lots to get through, but let's start with my take at 10. Oh dear. Another day, another anti-Semitism scandal from the left. This time in the ultra-woke Guardian newspaper, where Martin Rosen, the cartoonist, appears to echo deeply anti-Semitic tropes about the physical features of Jewish people, 
and references to money that you might have seen in 1930s German propaganda. Here it is, and we've zoomed in to the offending part of the cartoon. I'll show you the whole image shortly. If you're listening on GB News Radio, let me tell you, it's a depiction of Richard Sharp, the outgoing BBC chairman, who I understand is Jewish. In this cartoon, he's holding a box that contains a blood-sucking octopus. So, the Goldman Sachs reference linking Jews to banking, the caricatured features, the pig's head and the tentacles, all of this imagery is potentially deeply offensive to Jewish people. It lies about their heritage, perpetuates dangerous myths and brings back shocking echoes of the past. Now, Martin Rosen is a talented guy, and I'm hoping that these unfortunate parallels were unintentional. But that itself is a concern because it suggests that anti-Semitism among some parts of the left isn't even conscious. Now, in the end, I think an artist, a comedian or a political satirist should put their work out there and be judged by it and have it debated from all sides. This guy should not be fired. Not in the way that the highly talented Bob Moran was fired for daring to question the COVID narrative with stunning and hilarious imagery like this. Look at that justification for lockdowns. An empty box. We've completely run out, says Matt Hancock to Boris Johnson. So, truly horrific though it is, I don't think this latest controversial cartoon by The Guardian's Rosen should be pulled. Why? Well, it's on the grounds of free speech. But it's a timely reminder that the so-called anti-racists who populate the pages of papers like The Guardian are arguably anything but. For these virtue-signalling hypocrites who see racism everywhere except where it is not, it would seem they are exactly that of which they accuse everyone else. The hypocrisy is truly shocking. Now, Independent Sage, Sage's sectarian wing, are encouraging us to wear a mask again as a result of a terrifying new variant called Arcturus, which sounds like an as yet undiscovered dinosaur. Well, I do wish these dinosaur professors would give it a rest and let us get on with our lives. They want to bring back testing as well. Give me strength. It's astonishing that these people still have a voice and that we can hear the nonsense they're spouting through those filthy rags on their faces. Now, Mark Dolan tonight is the home of viral videos and I went viral with this tweet, which was viewed by over a million people. It was simple. If you're listening on the radio, it reads, why are people still wearing masks? It touched a nerve. I think it's a fair question. In my view, and I'm no expert, it's abundantly clear that masks were a con for which there was never compelling evidence of efficacy pre-pandemic. And after three years of this measure and real-world data, the gold standard Cochrane report described their benefit as marginal, if that, hardly a ringing endorsement. If you're still wearing a mask in 2023, good luck to you. Go for it. But understand that whilst you may hope you're advertising your virtue, demonstrating that you're a nice, caring person, all you're really demonstrating is that you haven't looked at the data, that you're indulging in political theatre and that you've been had. Anyone still wearing a mask in 2023 is telling the world they are a brainwashed zombie. But keep it going. As I go about my daily life, it's nice to know where the numpties are. After Bud Light saw billions wiped off their stock value after hiring a trans woman for an ad campaign, have the finger-wagging elite learnt nothing? The Sun report that the team at the campaign for Real Ale, of whom I'm very supportive, have asked members about their age, gender, identity, their ethnicity and sexual orientation as part of a recent review. This is the campaign for Real Ale. Its report recommended that inclusion, diversity and equality training is built into training for festival organisers and said there should be a robust complaint handling process on site. I thought the campaign for Real Ale was about having fun. Oh, well, I don't want to get in trouble with these people. So here on Mark Dolan tonight, we've given some of the country's favourite beer brands a woke makeover. So, first of all, the makers of Guinness, they call it the black stuff. Well, from now on, it's of colour. San Miguel has transitioned and is now San Michel, and she's having a great time. The popular Dutch beer Heineken 
has had a makeover too, to include both sexes. It's now Heineken and Barbie. How about this one? The popular, there they are, aren't they gorgeous? The popular ale, old speckled hen next. We were worried about that one because old speckled hen, that's ageist, isn't it? So now it's experienced, wise speckled hen. London Pride, one of the best-selling beers in the country, is now London Gay Pride, of course it is. And last but not least, Abbott's Ale. The monks have been brewing it for centuries, but how do you update Abbott's Ale? Well, by renaming it Diane Abbott's Ale. Reaches the parts other beers don't. And finally, an unnamed man has been told by the authorities that he cannot father any more children as his sperm has been used to sire upwards of 600 offspring. Now, my team have been hard at work, day and night, trying to find out who he actually is and reveal his identity. Well, in a world exclusive, we have the first picture of this mystery man. What a handsome devil. Who could possibly resist? Now, an update on that Guardian story, the horribly anti-Semitic cartoon uh, that was published by The Guardian. Uh, an update we've got for you. The Guardian has now apologised to Richard Sharp and the Jewish community over the pulled cartoon. Martin Rosen has also apologised. He tweeted, Through carelessness and thoughtlessness, I screwed up pretty badly with a Guardian cartoon today, and many people are understandably very upset. I genuinely apologise unconditionally. A fuller response will be on my website in an hour's time. So what do you think? Uh, do you agree, do you disagree that The Guardian are guilty of outrageous hypocrisy, given the fact that they find racism everywhere, except on their own watch? Uh, mark at gbnews.uk. Also, Independent Sage, their sectarian wing, want to bring back the masks. Will you wear one? We'll discuss all of that with my pundits tonight. Kulveer Ranger, who is a former advisor to Boris Johnson, the very... Fertile Boris Johnson. Uh, we also have GB News senior political commentator Nigel Nelson, our latest recruit, and political commentator and broadcaster Alice Grant. Uh, Nigel, uh, this is an own goal from The Guardian, isn't it? Yeah, a bit, I think. Um, I just think that they took their eye off the ball on this one. Uh, and it's good that Martin's apologised for it. I mean, the cartoon itself is rather grotesque. He does do hard-hitting cartoons, but went a bit far on this one. Uh, the bit that surprises me is I would have thought the Guardian editor should have been somewhat uncomfortable with that cartoon uh, when they saw it and really should have asked Martin to do something completely different. Yeah. Um, cool, Veer, what's your reaction to this? Um, I, I'm not even convinced that the apology was, was, was really all that appropriate. Um, this guy's had a, a Diane Abbott moment, I think. She said that her anti-Semitic letter to The Guardian was a, a first draft. I mean, he's saying here that he somehow did this cartoon in error or carelessly. It didn't look very careless to me. Yes, I've read Martin's apology and it's very forensic in his description of how he's put this cartoon together. Fair dues to him to explain himself, but I know Nigel's been quite uh, polite to his colleagues on ex-colleagues on Fleet Street about how they've taken the eye off the ball. I think it's impossible that The Guardian could not have noticed or what is going on at The Guardian that they couldn't have noticed the anti-Semitic tropes that are quite visible in this cartoon. There are things that have been around since the turn of the 19th century. We, we've all seen them. Uh, we've seen them used horrendously to depict uh, the Jewish community and, you know, uh, really pick upon that community in the way that they do. And for them not to be blind to this just tells you something is categorically wrong at Guardian Editorial, that they could print this cartoon and, and not realise it. I, for one, and I'm sure others, will be quite angry about that. Well, I'm angry, Alice Grant, because this is The Guardian who seem to find racism everywhere, including places where it is not, and yet they've not spotted it on their own watch. Yes, and it's happened before, Mark, I think, with another comic in the past to do with Pretty Patel. I think the point is, is that, um, you know, I'm not sure what will happen to this artist, but I know that when Bob Moran started making his artwork politically... Um, you know, satirical, he was immediately cancelled and I think fired from his job working in the newspaper. And actually, his comics are so wonderful and his art, I think, gave so much support to people throughout lockdown. So I was really happy that you pulled up one of his drawings because I think that he makes some incredible art and 
it's really worth looking at. Yeah, I don't think it should yeah. be fired. I don't think that the cartoon should be pulled, but uh, I think it's important we debate uh, what's happening over there at The Guardian and in some parts of the left, and it's not everyone on the left, of course, but there is a rump uh, who seems to be just suffused in anti-Semitic sentiment. It's truly horrific and completely unacceptable. Uh, we'll look at... Let uh, me know your thoughts on that one, Mark, at gbnews.uk. A uh, quick word on masks, by the way. Look, the government... Sage, the authorities, they're very, very clear that the masks helped slow down the spread of COVID-19, um, linked to saving lives and preventing the spread, preventing the NHS going uh, uh, into uh, meltdown. Uh, that is the strong view of the majority of scientists and government advisor, advisors. It's not my view, but as I keep saying, this show's all about opinions. Uh, would you consider wearing a mask again if COVID cases go up? Let me know, Mark, at gbnews.uk. It is the coronation countdown. So next up, the queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. We're getting excited. It's just six sleeps until the big day. Kinsey's next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, <laughs> suffering on a scale right. completely unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said of the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. Right, folks, that Ooh. was a spicy one, wasn't it? With us four, plus a special guest. Sometimes she has to stick her foot in it. Sometimes she has to say things as they are. Sometimes I think we should keep the refugees and send the pensioners to Rwanda. <laughs> then we'd be in a much better state. Well, yeah. 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 The Saturday Five. Saturday nights from 8. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Uh, welcome back to the show. Now we've got the papers at exactly 10.30 sharp with full pundit reaction. But it's time now for US News with the Queen of US Showbiz Royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, just, what is it? Seven more sleeps until the big day. I know, but like less than that until I see you. I'm more excited about seeing my friend Mark Dolan. Well, we can't wait. Let's talk to our viewers and listeners about the coverage. So we're on air from 8 p.m. until 11 p.m. That's three hours on Coronation Eve. That is the 5th of May. And you're with me at the Palace right from the start. I cannot wait. Mark, it's going to be so much fun. 
Uh, well, listen, you're a proper celebrity in this country now. There'll be scores of fans wanting your autograph, wanting selfies. And, and, and how important is it for you to be here? Because we know everything is done online now and you've got a fantastic studio over there in Hollywood, California. But what does it mean to you to come to London for this? Well, I mean, I've told you before, I really envy your country's enthusiasm and patriotism. Um, I, it's something that I don't have and don't really, I mean, I see it at maybe a football game here in America, but, you know, it's, we're a pretty polarized country when it comes to politics. And it's honestly so romantic and beautiful to see your entire country rally around the monarchy and, and celebrate these public figures. Well, let's celebrate another wonderful occasion, Kate and William's anniversary. They really are the dream team, aren't they? They are. It's been so much fun to see them lately. It's, um, you know, we saw an impromptu pizza party last week. Uh, we also saw a, a purse snatching, which we, if you want to see that video, it's so cute. A baby grabs Kate's purse and it's on the GB News Instagram account if you're curious. But Kate lets the baby play with her very expensive handbag and then walks off and goes back to, there, is that not so precious? And goes back to co collect it. Um, but we've had some uniquely candid, uh, candid moments from the whales family family lately. Uh, just this beautiful photo celebrating their 12th wedding anniversary. You know, Catherine going viral this week talking about her beautiful engagement ring and how it once belonged to Princess Diana. They were the perfect size. Fans just gushed and loved hearing these little details from Catherine about Princess Diana. She's very, you know, she's usually pretty protective of that subject. So it was a rare moment to hear her talking about that. And then I think we're all so excited to see Prince George at the coronation. He's going to be one of the youngest men to ever participate in the coronation um, as one of the pages of honor for King Charles. Well, it's wonderful. He's a sweet little kid. In fact, they've got three gorgeous kids and a very strong relationship. They've had their ups and downs. I think uh, the, the engagement or at least the, the boyfriend-girlfriend situation was on pause for a little while uh, after they'd, they'd met. So their, their courtship was interrupted, but they finally got together. What makes that relationship tick, do you think? Well, you know, I, I honestly think that William watched his mother and father, and it was really important to him that he made the right decision. Patience is a virtue, truly, the Bible says it, and I think it's true. And I think that that is why he asked his brother to slow down when it came to Meghan Markle. I don't think there was anything nasty there. I just think he realized how important it was to make sure you were with the right person, because look at Jada Smith, Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith. I mean, it's important that you get it right, or they can make your life a nightmare. <laughs> too right, too right. Now, listen, I've got a couple of emails saying ignore Harry and Meghan, so let's skip them. And actually, we've got a week of royal stuff, you and me on Friday from eight. So, so let's um, hold fire now on the coronation. It, it is very exciting. Do join us on the radio and on TV on Friday night for, for all of the pre-match action. Um, can we have a quick word on why the most popular news presenter in America has just been fired. This is Tucker Carlson of Fox News. Three million viewers a night. The guy is a ratings machine. And here is the viral video, of the, uh, the actual video that he recorded after being fired. Take a listen to this. When honest people say what's true, calmly and without embarrassment, they become powerful. At the same time, the liars who've been trying to silence them shrink and they become weaker. That's the iron law of the universe. True things prevail. Where can you still find Americans saying true things? There aren't many places left, but there are some, and that's enough. As long as you can hear the words, there is hope. See you soon. Now, why is this guy such an important figure in American cultural and political life? You know, Mark, I just think he's fearless and he had the, he, you know, he had the courage to say things that other anchors wouldn't say. Oh, you know who he reminds me of? Mr. Mark Dolan. Um, but um, I, I, I'm not worried for Tucker Carlson because when you are a man of such integrity and when you are so fearless, you will move on to do bigger and better things. I mean, you, Megyn Kelly, who appears on this station uh, quite often, she moved on is now, you know, the, she has her own empire that she created herself. And I think we're going to see the exact same thing from Tucker Carlson. He's going to build his own media empire where he's still going to have a voice and people are 
are going to follow him, almost Joe Rogan style. I'm not worried for him at all. He's an incredible human being, and I wish him well. Thanks for the overly kind comparison, but uh, flattery will get you everywhere. He is a powerhouse of a broadcaster, a dropper of truth bombs. We try to do that on this show, as do you, Kinsey, and we'll do it face to face on Friday the 5th of May from 8 till 11 at the Palace. Kinsey Schofield flying to the UK. Have a safe trip. Can't wait to see you in Blighty. The wonderful Kinsey Schofield. Check out her website, To Die For Daily. She's got a hit podcast of the same name, which is all about royal stuff. So there you go. Um, next up, we've got the papers. Don't go anywhere. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I'm a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7pm. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to the show. It's been a really busy programme. I'll get to your emails shortly, mark at gbnews.uk. It's time now, as always, for this. Yes, hot off the press, it's the papers. And it's the Sunday papers. We start with the Sunday Express, always a brilliant read. Uh, they lead with King's solemn vow to serve us all. What a wonderful message. Millions watching the coronation invited to pledge allegiance. King Charles will make a poignant public pledge to serve all of the British people at his coronation on Saturday. That, of course, is a week today. He'll declare before guests at the ceremony in Westminster Abbey and a global TV audience, I come not to be served, but to serve. Also, love is in the air for Wills and Kate. Uh, fantastic news for them. They celebrate 12 years of happy marriage. The Sun on Sunday next. Is that right, folks? Yeah, let's go to the Sun on Sunday. Thank you. And we have exclusive Prince's Dash Harry in a hurry. Uh, he plans 24-hour coronation visit. Blink and you'll miss it. 
Prince Harry plans a whistle-stop trip to his dad's coronation next weekend. He'll see Charles crowned at Westminster Abbey, then aims to be back in the US for son Archie's fourth birthday. An insider confirmed he will be in and out of the UK in 24 hours. I'm not sure it's just the birthday that he's rushing to. I think he might be rushing away from the public that have had enough of the ginger Windsor. But uh, we'll discuss that with my pundits shortly. Uh, the Mail on Sunday now. We are all invited to swear our allegiance to the King. They're running with that story as well. William and Kate's love heart emoji to toast 12 years together. The Mirror, Royal Exclusive. 150 million on security hikes up coronation bill. Protesters and VIPs add to soaring costs. Total spend is set to reach a quarter of a billion. That's 250 million pounds. And new details of the ceremony have been revealed as featured in the Sunday Mirror, Nigel's old paper, before we poached him here over to GB News. The Observer now, Starmer, I'll be bolder than Blair on public sector reform. Keir Starmer tomorrow will pledge to lead a radical reforming Labour government that's bolder than Tony Blair's on public service reform as he announces plans to accelerate house building and get more young people on the property ladder in an exclusive interview with The Observer. Before Thursday's local elections, the Labour leader insists he will more than match Blair for radical ideas on overhauling public services, including the NHS. This will be a bold and reforming Labour government. It will bring about real change that I hope will be felt through the generations. Uh, also, Coast Guard left Channel migrants adrift. Hundreds of vulnerable migrants were abandoned to their fates after the UK Coast Guard effectively ignored reports of small boats in distress during the days leading up to the worst Channel disaster in 30 years when at least 27 people uh, died. That happened in uh, 2021. Tragic story. Uh, the Independent revealed the great Brexit clubs and pubs shutdown. Hospitality venue closures soar sixfold in a year triggered by EU staff shortages. Daily Star Sunday, Bobby Davro exclusive, Our Hell. Comic tells of fiance, fiance's cancer fight. Brave pair vow to carry on laughing. Now, Bobby Davro, brilliant comedian, good friend of the channel, good friend of this programme, Mark Dolan tonight. He's been on many times. He's revealed his fiance is battling cancer and how laughter is helping them to cope. The star spoke out to help others in a similar situation. Well, we've got more papers to come, but let's get pundit reaction to what you've heard so far. We've got a political communicator, political commentator, former advisor to Boris Johnson when he was mayor, Cool Via Ranger. GB News' his very own senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, and broadcaster and writer, Alice Grant. And what a lovely message, Culvier. King's solemn vow to serve us all. He's striking the right note, isn't he? He is striking the right note, and it's been quite selling, as we've seen over this week and in the run-up to the coronation, mm. just how much coverage the King is getting. Mm. But positive coverage in terms of the messaging he's playing out to the nation, uh, even the imagery of his past, of what type of person he's been, his beliefs. And these aren't just things that have come to the fore now. They've been there since the start. His views on uh, sustainability, his views on inclusiveness, his, his views on being a champion of all faiths. He was the one who coined the defender of all faiths, and he's going to be saying that as a king as well. I, I, I think it's a wonderful moment, not just for him, um, but I think it could be for the country, because we all wondered how are we going to move on from this magnificent queen that we had, yeah. uh, uh, you know, a queen that spanned generations, that spanned so many challenges, was the queen of our lives. And it, seemed, it was huge shoes for him to fill, but he seems to be starting off very, very well. Yes, and his approach is different to that of, of, of his role as Prince of Wales, in which he was the campaigning prince. And I think he's been on the right side of the argument when it comes to, as you mentioned, sustainability. He talked about organic farming yeah. and talking to his plants. People thought he was bonkers, but actually organic farming is a really important part of the mix here in the UK. And, and actually, he's founded the Dutchy Originals brand, a successful business. So, you know, this guy was very active for many years. But now he's, I feel, stepped back slightly and, and is what he needs to be, which is a great monarch for all. Yes, there's a period of transition here, isn't it, for him to go from that campaigning prince, a prince with beliefs and ideals, to a more of a, the monarch who will stand back and more observe but through the deeds that he's done and allow some of his family, his, his younger members, and there we've seen yeah. William and Kate really also coming through quite strongly in their interactions with the public and what they're doing at the moment, and also the Queen Consort. 
yes. in her role as well. So it's being played very well. You have to congratulate the royal family and the people who are advising them right now because, as you said earlier, Mark, they seem to be hitting the right note. That's very hard to do. It's a very delicate balance of getting those right messages, chiming with the mood of the nation. We have so many different views nowadays. So the, the rainbow of different opinions to, to get people together and agree with, I think they're just doing a fantastic job. Well, yes, uh, forgive my memory, Alice. Where are we five or six months into the reign of King Charles? So far, so good. Yes, I think you pointed out something really beautiful, which is this idea of service, which is definitely going to come through, mm. um, as the Archbishop suggested, through the Christian liturgy. And it's so important because I think that maybe, um, you know, our politicians and our political class have forgotten a bit how important service is and really what their job is as our leaders and as a leader, as the ultimate leader, the monarch. I really think that he will embody that kind of self-sacrificial service, which we so want to see in our public figures. And I think that it can sometimes feel that the authority in this country almost expect us to serve them and us to serve the state. And mm. over the last few years, we've seen so much division in our country caused by crises like, you know, the coronavirus, in which when we were suddenly expected to to serve the state, and it was it, it felt very top down. Mm. But actually, these people that we elect are here to serve us, and our monarch is there to serve us, and that authority is such a beautiful responsibility as well. And it's straight out of his mother's mm. playbook absolutely, to, to, to serve absolutely. rather than be served, and the Precisely. queen mother. It really, yeah, it, it, it's it's a lifetime yeah. of, of duty, and it's something of very much a Christian principle and mm. as a Catholic, as, as you know, um, service and the importance of that duty about serving others is something which Christ showed us and that's something very special. And I for think. those who lead us mm. and the, 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 the priests in your church uh, yeah. to be humble. Exactly, precisely, you know, and also, you know, you can have that humility whilst also acknowledging that as the monarch he deserves to have this wonderful spectacle, which, as Kinsey said so, so um, wonderfully earlier, that this is really such a uniting thing for our country and it's something so beautiful that we have a monarchy which will unite us all despite all the divisions and all the... everything that's gone on for the past few years, that this is something really special for well, us. Well, absolutely. Nigel, you've been headquartered for many years in Westminster as a political editor. Do you think that Charles is a good politician? Then we've got that, that to find out. Um, he because didn't unfortunately, though we, we wish it wasn't, it, it is necessary that he has that skill set. Yes, it? I mean, I'm more interested... I'm not a royalist, but mm. I am a monarchist. And the bit... What's the difference? The difference is that um, I believe in the monarchy because I like the idea of having a non-political head of state. Mm. And so that's why I want uh, the king to be that, that person. Um, Charles uh, did interfere an awful lot in politics, which he shouldn't do. The role of the head of state is when everything else goes wrong, that's when the head of state might have to, have to uh, come in. So I'm curious to see... I mean, all the words about being the people's king and so on, all great, that's fine. Um, but what he really needs to do is, is how he steps up to the plate to be head of state in the same way that his mother did. Yes, and when you say you're, you're a monarchist but not a royalist, what, 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 what is the difference there? What, what, what is a royalist that a monarchist isn't? Well, I haven't got much time for the but royal family. But essentially, it's, it's sort of like you're not a cheerleader for the royal family. That's right. I haven't got much time for the royal family. And you're family. probably not that keen on, on there being a big gravy train for obscure cousins. And not at all, no. <laughs> uh, or Prince Harry or, or whatever. No, all those things. Right. The idea of what, that everything that goes with the royal family I find rather irritating. Mm. Um, and so my interest in Charles is not as a royal, it is his political role as a head of state. But uh, Charles uh, is moving towards Nigel's view of uh, a monarchy, isn't it? The slim-down yes. approach, the less Yeah, I mean, uh, th that's roles, why I don't think... Uh, the the modernisation of it is uh, uh, this, right. this, this, this is why I said that what, what is it, his words so far are great. If he carries all that out, that'll be an improvement on the, the royal family we've seen before. Um, but let's see how he does. And I uh, think that the important yeah. thing is he keeps out of politics... Yeah. unless he needs to actually be involved because we, we are paralysed politically. I, I think you're right. I think the other thing that we can notice, the way that him and his son William are working together here. Yeah. I think there's a very closeness here between them about how they're choreographing this, the kind of reign that Charles will have and be the precursor for what William will bring in. So I think there's some really good long-term foundations that these two could be putting in place for the future of the monarchy, yeah, which will align with yeah, some of the things that you're saying. Exactly. Right? But, yeah. Alice, you're nodding your head there that, that the king mustn't become political, and we know that 
that mm. the gravitational pull will be a strong one for Charles. Yes, and I and I agree. think that it's instant game over if he if he gets yeah. involved in let's say the net zero agenda, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. some controversy about whether he should apologise for slavery or examine the royal family's links to slavery. Uh, in in these areas, it's contentious, isn't it? Absolutely. I think the British public are just really sick of being lectured by by people who they consider to be in extremely privileged positions, telling them how they should live their lives. We've had this incessantly over the last you know, couple of decades through celebrities and media. And quite frankly, I don't think anyone wants to hear about, you know, how they should cut their fuel costs or, you know, whatever, stop flying and stop going on holiday. And this kind of micromanaging of our lives, which is really, quite frankly, overstepping. Well, well let's get the gloves off. <laughs> Mark Dolan tonight is the home yeah. of truth bombs. <laughs> is King Charles woke? Oh, gosh. Well, to be honest, I don't know all of his opinions, but I, I think he should definitely stay out of climate change, net zero, and anything to do with these kind of more globalist -y institutions like the WEF and Davos and all those. I know that he has some connections there, so it's best to, to avoid that. C concerns <laughs> about his, you know, courtship of Bill Gates and all the rest of it, it, it mm. that's not a conspiracy theorist, is it? I mean, Charles is pretty signed up to the net zero agenda. He's going to have to be very careful whether, whether it comes to, um, you know, the climate or, or, or indeed the world economy yes. or any of these other issues. He cannot make those proclamations like he used to make. He can't interfere, as Nigel was saying. Mm. He, he has had long-held beliefs. He's, he's been aware he of these use, things. Will he use William to do it for him? And is that not just as bad? No, I think William will have to be as kept. That's why I mean they're working very closely together. Because here, we're not, you know, Charles, however long he may be king, mm. William will be king within a, a period of time. So this isn't something where Charles knew he had an extended period of time as prince and he had to find a life and things to believe in and things to drive forward. He could not have remained silent for the 70 odd years of his life. He has lived his life. He's done the Prince's Trust. He's done things about sustainability. He's had opinions. I think these are wonderful things that he's done. Now it's the new age of the monarchy. He'll be a king and he has to yeah, be Yeah, now quiet. time to be king, basically. Yeah, to be king yeah. and, and, and pave the way for the type of king his son will also be. And Keir Starmer would like to be king or at least prime minister. <laughs> the observer, <laughs> Nigel. Prime minister, I think. Uh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> He'll take that for starters. I'll be bolder than Blair on public service reform. Uh, this That's is an exclusive in the observer. <laughs> Do you feel that Keir Starmer has lost a little momentum of late? Uh, I, actually, I rather thought he gained it because we went through um, the first sort of couple of years of Keir Starmer where there were no policies. Um, he was incredibly cautious about uh, about what he said and what he did, um, and and suddenly now he's bursting out. Not 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 always uh, very cleverly. I don't like the, um, the the Rishi attack ads, for instance. I think that was a mistake. What he's saying to the Observer is he wants to be more radical than Tony Blair. A lot of comparisons with Tony Blair, there were, that um, because he is, Keir Starmer is soft left the same way that Tony Blair was. What he's talking about in The Observer is um, housing. Um, it's not quite up there with education, education, education. I think you need a, I think what Keir Starmer really needs is a big idea. And most importantly, to be a success, which is what all prime ministers need, is an un underlying political philosophy. Tony Blair had it, Margaret Thatcher had it. Prime ministers who don't have it don't last very long. Well, can you imagine Keir Starmer as your prime minister? If our system is increasingly presidential and it's Sunak versus Starmer at the moment with first past the post that is the choice uh, which side do you sway towards let me know mark at gbnews.uk I'll be asking Alice and Culver so Starmer on trial next we've also got tomorrow's Sunday Times with a cracking front page headline and my pundits will be nominating their front page heroes and back page baddies so all of that in two It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. 
I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians. Yes, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Uh, we've got the papers in the company of political commentator, former advisor to Boris Johnson, Culver Ranger. GB News's brand new senior political commentator. The dream team just got bigger. It's the amazing Nigel Nelson. And a very good friend of the show, political commentator, a wise head on young shoulders, Alice Grant. Um, let's have a look at the Sunday Telegraph. Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. I support Kemi Badenoch in her war on wokery and pledge allegiance to the king from your sofa. Uh, that's, of course, in relation to the coronation. This is the coronation countdown and Mark Dolan tonight will be at the coronation on Coronation Eve. And that is the term that we tried to coin. And that will be from 8 p.m. till 11 on Friday evening, all day Saturday, Nigel and my amazing colleagues will be throwing everything at it, so do join us. GB News is your coronation station. Uh, let's go back to Keir Starmer. This in the Observer, Culver Ranger, um, and it's an interview that he's given to the Observer. Admittedly, a pretty, a pretty soft touch interview. Uh, Starmer, I will be bolder than Blair on public service reform. Is he Tony Blair 2.0? Absolutely not. Not at the moment, and I don't think he'll get anywhere near Tony Blair, because, look, Tony Blair was an exceptional politician, uh, a man with big ideas, but also a man with an exceptional team that was coming in with him. And I was very fortunate to have dinner with Alan Milburn uh, earlier this week. Former health secretary. Yes, uh, one of the brains trust around the new Labour project. Mm. And there was very much a project because at that point, yes, the Conservatives had been in power for quite a long time. Um, we had the Thatcher era, the John Major as Prime Minister. And, and Labour had taken a hell of a beating at a number of elections, but they had taken then time to work out what they needed to do, what were the big ideas that they needed to bring forward to be not just, yes, we need time for a change, but to be attractive to the electorate, to solve some of the modern-day problems. And that's what Sir Keir Starmer needs to be talking about now. So what I'd like to hear is not just what these big, bold ideas are, because he says they're going to be looking at housing and education and health, but this took a hell of a lot of input from the private sector. 
And he's saying not much about that at the moment. Mm. It also took a really good team around him. And we need to see that strength of team. So at the moment, we need to understand what are the ideas, what are they going to do, how are they going to do it, and what does Sakir Starmer's project really mean before you could say anything like he's going to be like Blair? Yes, indeed. And Blair had inherited a relatively healthy economy courtesy of the magnificent Chancellor, Kenneth Clark. Yes, and, and had the ability to actually take okay. that money and go for it. Because you need money to do yeah. things as well. Two, so where's two, he going to get the money two, from? Right. Uh, emails coming in on this. Starmer for Prime Minister, definitely not, says Stelios in Doncaster. Sunak versus Starmer. Hi, Mark, says Dave. Neither. I'm voting for Richard Tice and Reform UK. Starmer as PM, could the last person uh, leaving the country turn the lights out, says Richard. Janice says, hi, Blair will run the country through Starmer, God help us. And uh, <laughs> Jeff, Keir Starmer, no, never, never, never. Oh, my God, I can't find any positive words. Camille, heaven forbid that Starmer ever comes RPM. Only a couple of seconds on this, Alice, but I think this is the issue, is that people are fed up with the Tories. They're a toxic yeah. brand, but I don't think enough people like Keir Starmer. Yeah, I love those emails. I love the British people. They don't <laughs> They're very around. much against... And also, you know, it's very clear that Keir Starmer is just... He just... Like, if you read the interview, there's no, no substance at all. There's absolutely no substance to anything he says. It's quite drastic. Well, look, we've got two minutes, a minute each for your goodies and baddies. So let's start with your headline heroes. Who is your headline hero, Culvia? King Charles. <laughs> uh, he's playing a blinder and, and, you know, good luck to him. This is going to be that big moment of his life, big moment for, in all of our lives. We're going to share it with him. It is those four words, so far, so good. Your headline hero, Nigel. Yeah, it's uh, Tony Dernan, who came last yes. in the London Marathon. Um, uh, he'd, he'd suffered a, a bleed on the brain after, after a car accident, but still was brave enough to run the marathon to raise six, £600 for charity. He ended up raising 17000 when when the video went viral. Absolute legend. Uh, well done to Tom. And how about you, Alice, your headline hero? Um, my headline hero is going to be Andrew Bridgen, the controversial MP who was recently just basically cancelled by the party. Yeah. But he's been such a vocal critic of so many issues which are so important to the British people, such as the way lockdowns were handled, the WHO, which seemed to be like this unelected, unaccountable, supranational body who have was, you know, came out of nowhere and started dictating to the rest of the world public health. Um, so I actually really loved his speeches in those committees when he was talking about yes, COVID vaccines. Yes, he did not compare so. the vaccine rollout to the Holocaust. He quoted a Jewish academic mm, who made exactly. that remark. Exactly. Um, Andrew so, will uh, love you for that. <laughs> <laughs> up Andrew Bridgen briefly now. Very apologies, but uh, yes, baddie. Who's your baddie, Colvier? Well, there was a poll this week about how Londoners feel that Sadiq Khan is doing as mayor of London, and over 50% I believe he's doing badly or very badly. It That's was, London. It was so much better when you were in City Hall. <laughs> Nigel, you're baddie. Uh, the inflexible Foreign Secretary James Cleverley for refusing Sudanese doctors the paperwork to come to Britain. That looks like an own goal. And Alice? My baddie's the whole Labour Party. I think they've just been a disaster this week with Keir Starmer and Diane Abbott and just this mess. They're totally unelectable. Okay. Brilliant, brilliant <laughs> pundits. Most importantly, thank you for your company. We'll do it all again tomorrow at 9. Headliners is next. Hello, welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office, I'm Marco Catania. We hold on to fairly showery conditions across the UK over the next couple of days, but things will turn drier into next week as pressure starts to rise and we'll see some warm sunshine at times too. Low pressure is generally in charge at the moment given these fairly showery conditions, but notice pressure rising there as we head into the early part of next week and it's this that promises to bring the quieter conditions, certainly by Tuesday next week. Back to this evening, into the overnight period, showers from the world go out towards the west and they'll develop elsewhere across the northern and western parts as we head into the early hours of Sunday. Some of those showers quite heavy, locally on the thundery side, with the clearest skies down towards the southeast and up towards the northeast. And here we'll see some fairly chilly conditions too. Temperatures are close to freezing across a few spots towards the northeast of Scotland. As for Sunday itself, well, showers from the world go out towards the west, becoming more uh, widespread as we go through the day. I think it's the southeast of England, best place to hold on to some bright weather throughout into the afternoon, whereas the showers out towards the west, turning locally heavy and even thundery, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. I think here we could see some quite torrential downpours into the afternoon. Temperatures doing well in the southeast in the sunshine, up to 18 or 19 degrees. Cooler though towards the northeast of Scotland. And heading into the evening, the showers tend to migrate their way eastwards across the UK. So we start to see some developing across the southeast of England. Fewer showers meanwhile developing out towards the northwest. So through Sunday night, some clearer spells developing here. But with a fairly cloudy uh, skies on the whole into the, the overnight period, those temperatures do hold up fairly well across the board. Lows in the range 7 to 11 Celsius. As for Monday, well, a fair few showers are still expected, 